Okay, so uh, I would like to take uh, start at the note that um, Bex has ended in by thanking uh, that and society for taking me in with, uh, along with many of my ideas, which don't always end on an upward note or a set of strategies, and then for sticking with me as I grappled with the U.S. office immigration issues, and in particular to Audrey and Seth and CG and uh, Rigo and Janet and everyone else I'm forgetting for making my transa transition into New York City, which can be brutal, very, very smooth. I have, it's been, however short, this has been transformational, and I am going to treasure the friends and colleagues that I have made here in this time. So today I would like to... It's, it's an oxymoron because I'm really terrified to speak about fear, actually. <laughs> but maybe that's how it's supposed to be done. So today I would like to... Um, outline briefly why paranoia, however methodical, and anxiety embedded in so many of our current social and cultural techno discourses um, on surveillance, fake news, and uh, platform capitalism more broadly may not be so conducive to uh, different technologies in the future. And then uh, to conclude, I will speak more about speculative and auxiliary practices we can perhaps assume or contemplate uh, in form of games in order to reintroduce the complexity necessary to think about how to operate within this global surveillance regimes as each individual user. So again, this is very much self-reflectively centered. I'm not saying that someone should adopt it. I'm just saying this is how I would think about it for each and every one of us. So I do want to talk about fear because this is something that I've been breaking up and uh, focused on a lot in my own practice and trying to understand how um, new alliances between states and corporations and media um, uh, centered around data hoarding are, uh, are sort of generating this new large big complete misunderstood spaces and how we can break them up and understand them a little bit better but also because I found out that this fear and anxiety resonates a lot with many of my colleagues when I mention it in simpler terms people no longer want to hear about hygiene of the internet exclusively and how we constantly have to lock our doors and protect ourselves it's just not a natural way of being so as far as survival goes it's necessary but as far as living beyond survival and and uh, and breathing freely and being creative it might not necessarily be conducive so I guess my art and research is, has two parallel, occasionally overlapping paths, and one is the counter-forensic investigation that is the uh, trying to map up the new sovereignties um, produced by the global sur expansion of the global surveillance industry, because I don't feel like we're um, addressing that as much as a global phenomena and as a global new uh, sort of consort of power. And the second is uh, working collaboratively with a number of philosophers and other artists, technologists and media professionals and anyone who want to collaborate really on speculative future-oriented um, proposals and art projects that are informed by investigation. So let me very quickly summarize um, the former in order to give you a good premise for um, the futures that I want to speak about. Uh, so I've been focusing on the way companies, for some time now, for many years before that in society, I've been focused on the way uh, companies consolidate power in particular, and the way this is sort of misrepresented in, the, in, misrepresented in the media and our responses, which is still confined by locality and particular events and sort of putting precise villains on a spot line, such as Musk or Bezos or Zuckerberg, not to say that those people are great, they aren't, they're terrible. Uh, but it's not just, if it only was that easy, it's very easy to sort of uh, um, get righteously indignated over Bezos, he invites all the hates you can master, but then as soon as I'm, we talk about how much more complex it is and how we are all involved in some of these processes, many people are just going, oh, I don't know, I don't know, <laughs> I'm not feeling for this today, let's, let's go back to that other, hating that other guy, <laughs> it's much easier, you know. So, and usually this work is presented in this giant large-scale site-specific installation where I mix documents and audio files and images and text in a way that help you walk through it and maybe see some of the connections that weren't 
previously made immediately apparent in our existing mainstream discourses on surveillance. But since we don't really have time to or space to host an exhibition in New York, I will give you like what it would look like. So here's what surveillance complex look like as an industry um, uh, in a few seconds around the globe. All around the world. And all of these uh, companies that know each other and state officials that know and collaborate between each other. This is Uzbekistan transaction. And uh, you can see more of, uh, uh, more of the text around these issues on my website. And here is usually what a uh, surveillance business sounds like. Can you read? Is it visible? I'll summarize it. It just, I wanted to um, go back. There was this favorite one, li one last slide that uh, sort of the customers write back to surveillance companies. Most of it is not working, and there is a lot of swearing and dead jokes going on, and uh, it's all very banal and, and kind of unsophisticated. And just to, for a good effect, to focus a little bit on the traditional customers of surveillance and big data companies are usually existing governments, but I would like to play just this one audio of other sort of more auxiliary customers which represent the internet, in this case, the interests of US and, and British uh, governments, and then purchase these technologies from companies like Variant Israel in order to uh, use them on existing governments in, say, Global South or in Middle East, and then uh, uh, help the revolutionaries install new governments and then continue to use the surveillance uh, tools in order to have these governments be more compliant with the US foreign policy. So just in their own words, just a very quick, let's see. This is an experiment. If it doesn't work, I tried. Is that it? You could call us, we call ourselves as a joke, uh, you know, the, the shop toys are us. We call ourselves revolutions are us. <laughs> we, we are probably the most active law firm in the world when it comes to <coughs> working with revolutions. Uh, we are currently working on on DRC with Christian, we work with Somaliland, Somalia, Somaliland. We work with Syria. Uh, we work with Ethiopia. We are, etc., uh, etc. Et we have uh, our engagement in Africa come, goes back to. We did a peace process in Darfur, our firm. We did a peace process in Libya, not so successful, uh, but uh, we tried. Uh, we were not involved in Iraq and Afghanistan. We work in Pakistan. We work on Iran, etc., uh, etc. Et um, most revolutions that are brewing in the world, we are some, to some extent involved in. Most armed opposition groups and non-armed opposition groups are people that we meet frequently with. Um, so yeah, this is just a, a law firm, very Western, very white law firm that marks, um, masks itself as something that uses surveillance to do to buy activist causes. So basically, this guy and Bex are we're like we're the same people. They are just here to help you. Um, so yeah, this is um, this brings me to my overarching points, which I would get to making as soon as I figure out how this works. There we go. Right. So to proceed to some of the takeaway points, I guess, this is really vastly oversimplified. The relationship between Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, Huawei, Telesonera, Siemens, to name a few, Verint Israel, uh, are not, and the sort of the way we read the, about them in conjunction with elections, are not a deviation from a norm. It is the norm. Uh, or as the CEO of Hacking Team uh, said to me during our interview in Milan, we don't do business in North Korea, and this is our motto. So everyone else at any other time is totally cool. And um, I think this, is, um, this norm is interesting because uh, to speak and think about it longer because it is relying on our collective normativity in order to be accepted as such. And... 
I think uh, it's something that is important to think about because uh, we complement very often the Swedish example in uh, in terms of uh, progress of the defense of the user data, but. Um, the democracy in Sweden doesn't really matter so much as long as Swedish telecoms are still accepting tender contracts from national security services that are confirmed to boil people alive. These things will still come back to us. It's only as democratic as it is globally democratic. It doesn't matter how good you perform in your local sphere. So we need to think about this as something without perhaps example. And this is difficult. But Secondary, secondly, excuse me, um, not the transaction that I'm describing, the uh, contracts that occur within these environments may be secret, but the ecosystems and the sort of the property and, and the number of people that are involved with them are not secret. And I think by looking at these ecosystems or let's say the, the metadata around the secret events and by correlating them with what else is going on at that time around the world, on a global scale as well as locally, will give us a very good estimate as to what happens in those contracts. So just saying that everything is secret and we don't know is, is a diversion, I think. We can very well figure it out, what's up, by knowing all the other um, properties of a certain event. And in fact, some of this could be predicted. And this is, I'm going to get to our fun part now. So just to make an example, one of the projects that I, uh, I decided to um, remix a bunch of slogans from uh, Messina Group, Cambridge Analytica, and uh, other uh, data-centric political consultancies and designed together with my friend Sam Levine, who is on the back here, a mock-up website for a mock-up company. That is basically like another Cambridge Analytica, and it, it looks very um, unsophisticated, should we say. It's just the front that is using a lot of, of the same slogans that just looks exactly like that company. And then I run a, an ad in popular uh, job application platforms, um, inviting people to apply as the head of big data campaign for the upcoming 2019 Nigerian elections and with the future for uh, having more jobs in sort of mingling with the elections in the global south. It was a very sophisticated live written ad, but ultimately it says, could you care help come over and help us fuck with the elections in Nigeria? Please bleep that. So I thought no one, no one is going to respond to that. It's like Guardian and New York Times writing about Cambridge Analytica all the time. And like the journalists are going to out me in 15 minutes and it will all be very over and the world is a great place. And I run this ad uh, specifically in London and in DC where people read and they depend for their job on such media so that it could be over with quickly and I will sort of have this renewed, rejuvenated sense in, in us being very, very informed and better people because, you know, hacking elections has become uncool in 2018. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> so wrong. Here is just a list of, um, each one of these represents, I think, a worthy candidate. And here is a byline from all of the bios. And I think I've selected specifically, so um, none of the fortune trolls, none of the fascists, really, more like kind of the people we would hang out with. And I, you know, I don't know what TED speaker blockchain evangelist means, but I guess, you know. <laughs> uh, funny, but I mean, <laughs> also very, very depressing in the sense that we can't possibly argue that any of these individuals have not gotten the memo. And I think we need to find a way to focus and address the duality of both accepting that Cambridge Analytica and Facebook suck, but at the same time looking for a job in a company that is just like this and being ready to fly over to Nigeria and use social media to make people's life somewhere else very, very miserable. So I don't know how we do it, but somehow, I mean, I understand that it's a job and everyone works for money, but somehow when people steal from shops because they need money, we call them criminals. And when they take money from Nigerian dictators uh, and accept this sort of jobs, we call them business oriented and market adaptable, um, highly qualified professionals. 
So, um, uh, I'm so unfortunately, I can't show the entire company uh, structure yet in the full ads, but uh, just to sort of promote this uh, because it's an ongoing experiment and I would like to see more of what people would be proposing as a strategy for Nigeria and maybe distract them from actually hacking the Nigerian elections in the meantime. Uh, but uh, I would be running a series of, of text pieces on this and revealing the website as well. So if you do want to uh, publish this or get engaged, please um, get in touch. So to come back to number three again, Um, however complicated the systems are, they're not necessarily very complex. And I think in that non-complexity, they rely very much on... Um, they're very similar in the way we try to simplify the way we interact and think about technology. And I want to spend the last few minutes on thinking about how we can maybe make ourselves a little bit uh, less useful by stepping away from uh, uh, producing fairly straightforward forms of digital activism, uh, which sometimes reliant on tools uh, and on like in your doors and buying user technologies to thinking about technology outside of its value as a tool or outside of its value as a property and something that we are architects of. And by architects, I don't only mean as someone that writes code, but architects as in we think about what kind of technology could be possible. And to conclude on something more specific, this is a project that I have developed that I would like to invite everyone who is interested in this team to participate on. It's called Speculative Media Lab. It's a prototype uh, mediascape uh, designed for collective play through which artists, journalists, and technologists and other media professionals can foster media practice that counters algorithmically driven production of network content. Uh, which is often the kind of production that becomes a profit driver for many of the surveillance companies that we have around the world. Uh, using a set of specific uh, purpose-based technologies, this project uh, will download the entirety of the internet production uh, that is meant to communicate something to someone uh, in a from within a very, very narrow time frame, and by narrow I mean we're talking about fraction of a second here, it will then again use code to scrap some of the key social constructs that made uh, this online content very profitable for algorithms such as gender, nationality, ethnicity, political affiliation, and so forth. And then uh, the lab is inviting a number of participants to, to, in real time, try to make sense of the archive or what's left of the archive, archive and try to recontextualize it um, using categories that go beyond the normative and existing um, editorial conventions and beyond the current uh, forms of algorithmic sorting. And I hope that this and some of the other projects that I'm working on, which I unfortunately won't have to time anymore to go into, will um, inspire us to think a little bit about how we are all very much part of this surveillance machine, but also how we can perhaps consider forming more playful, uh, less neoliberal media practices uh, right within it or nested within it and, and go undetected while also making ourselves a little bit um, less useful or rather more useless uh, to the surveillance mechanisms and these sovereignties. Thank you so much.